Hey, hey, thanks again for pressing play and welcome to the Suns Jam Session podcast on the Bright Side of the Sun podcast network. I'm one of your hosts, John, and I'm very excited that you decided to join us today. Wherever you're listening, make sure you subscribe, rate, and review. If you're following the show, we want you to do that. We want you to subscribe. We want you to hit the bell. We want you to hang out with us every time we go live because we're going to be going live a lot very soon as the Suns season is about to get to begin. So go ahead, follow the show on Twitter at Suns Jam. You can subscribe on YouTube. You can do all kinds of stuff. Just just follow us wherever you're at, okay? Uh, it is that time to bring in my good friend, the master of the microphone, one Matthew Lissy. Matthew Policy, how you doing today, man? <laughs> Good man, my full name you call me by. Is that the first time you've done that? Am I in trouble or something, Matthew no. Paul? Let's see. No? Every now and then, I just like to you know keep you in check and remind you. Okay, I that- appreciate that. I need that. I need some obedience, man. <laughs> this wild life I live, you know, in this tiny New York apartment I have, I just I'm out of control. Seriously. <laughs> yeah, slow your roll, settle down. Okay, okay. And, and, I will. And, and okay, and do the right thing. I will definitely do. Hey, it seems like um, between Sunday and Thursday, it feels mm-hmm. like definitely like longer, of course, because there's one more day. But doesn't it feel like a month between these podcasts? Like I miss you so much. Sometimes, like, seriously. Well, I think with everything that's kind of going on in the world outside of here, it feels like that because I, I with NFL especially, you know, we yeah. do a podcast on Sunday, and then there's Monday Night Football. Then this week there was Tuesday Night Football. And then yesterday was Wednesday. Thursday night football is going on. Like you, I just don't know what day of the week it is anymore. All I know is <laughs> yeah, it feels dude. like it's a long time in between our podcasts. It's only like three or four days since I've seen you. So everything good in the world of you? Yeah, I know. I feel good. I'm ready to talk some basketball, dude, because we're yeah. getting started here soon. You know, I'm running through podcasts, running through every Suns podcast, every basketball podcast. I am preparing because it's going to be a fun ride, dude. And I can't wait to get started. I've been listening to – this was, like, was definitely a podcast week for me. Like, it was. I go through stages where I listen to a lot of music. I'll, I'll catch an artist and something will hit my ear just right. And I go down that rabbit hole and I'll be listening to that artist for like a week straight of just a heavy rotation. And this is one of those weeks where I found myself like I couldn't get enough podcast listens. Like I listened to the book of basketball 2.0. I'm pretty much all the way caught up on those. Uh, all the smoke podcast. Kelly Oubre was on there. Really so good. I listened to that. Uh, JJ Reddick's podcast. CP3 was on there. So I was really listening good. to that. And, I've, and then, of course, I always listen to like Bill Simmons. And I mean, there was a lot of podcasts to catch up on. Yeah, definitely. It doesn't end. And uh, it's going to continue to be a lot. I don't know if people are going to do as much as us, but they're definitely going to be, you know, they're going to be definitely uh, trying to keep up with us, I feel like. Uh, but it gets you prepared, dude. I think a lot of the times, too, when you're listening to these podcasts, I feel like it's too much. We get really focused on one team. And that one team, I feel like, is the Phoenix Suns this year. I feel like we're going to be on a lot of podcasts, usually in the past. Yep we would never get mentioned. But this year, we're going to be almost on every recap. Uh, I know KOC and uh, Chris Vernon, they have their own show now, The Mismatch, which is their own entity. They're going to be talking yeah. about the Suns a lot too. One of my favorite shows. Oh, yeah. Yeah, KOC, uh, he's been preaching for the Suns for a few years now, and it's going to be nice to hear Can't him make ho- hopefully take a few victory laps. I mean, we'll see how these Suns I play. Uh, I think that the anticipation's there, and we're all very excited as as podcast hosts, as Suns fans, and as a Suns community. Everybody's excited. the The bandwagon is filling up, if you will. So, yes. um, we're gonna have another great show today. We're actually gonna have a fellow podcaster from SB Nation's Detroit Bad Boys, uh, Laz Jackson, is gonna be joining us to talk about uh, Langston Galloway. You know, uh, one of those new Phoenix Suns who I don't know a lot about. So, I'm really excited to have uh, Laz on the show just to. To give us some insight into this player and who he is and who the the back end of the Suns rotation is going to be. And I, I'm excited for that. Uh, we're going to talk about some of those podcasts and some of those interviews that Kelly Oubre had and CP3 had. And then, of course, we're going to preview that first Jazz versus Suns preseason game on this podcast. So a uh, lot to get to. But the first thing we have to do is crack a beer, my friend. Wow, three oh, weeks yeah. in a row for me. Three Look weeks at in you, a row. man. Drinking the Coors no. Banquet. I got the Coors Banquet. Yeah, Mama's let, proud. Let, Let's let's pop open a beer. Oh yeah! Oh, that was a weak one. Sorry about uh, that. It sounded good. It sounded good. Uh, and let's talk Suns, baby. So one of the newest members of the Phoenix Suns 
is Langston Galloway. And we're very uh, excited and humbled and honored to be joined by Lazarus Jackson. He's joining us from SB Nation's Detroit Bad Boys. Laz, how you doing? I'm doing great. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, hear yeah. you just great. You sound perfect, man. Guys? Yep. Can you yeah. hear Okay, perfect. All right. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome, I was worried about that. No, I'm doing great. <laughs> yeah, I can hear you guys. Thanks for having me. It's uh, it's great to be on. Man, Laz, you got a great podcasting voice. I'll give you that. You're like perfect. Yeah. <laughs> you and John right here, you guys have one of the top top 10, I think, that I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> so how's everything going in Detroit, Laz? I mean, you had no bubble experience for the Pistons last year. Uh, was that upsetting or did you understand the Pistons not making the cut? It was it was understandable, but it was definitely frustrating, right? Especially for a team that was uh, de- heading down like the rebuild path for a team that played as many young guys in the rotation as the Pistons did. You would like to, for those guys to obviously get be able to get the player development that they need, and that didn't happen. But uh, you know, from a logistical and from a financial and from a health and safety standpoint, it really didn't make a lot of sense for the like for teams that weren't going to be competing in the playoff to be in the bubble. So it was understandable, but frustrating, you know? So how excited are you to actually get the season started? Oh man. Distance again. (laughs) So excited. Scale scale one to 10, huh? Like 12. It's been, it's been nine months almost, right? Like, and the thing that also makes it exciting is that the, the Pistons have revamped this entire roster, right? Like you've seen uh, what, what they've done in free agency, the entire, uh, you know, tenor and tone of the team has changed. And so, like, I we don't know what this team is going to look like until we see it on the floor. So, yeah, tomorrow at 7, looking forward to it. What are your initial thoughts on the roster changes? Like, obviously, you're excited because there's a lot of unknowns. Do you think that a, a lot of the moves were positive, or do you think that you stayed the same or got worse? I think uh, I think there were definitely some, cur- some curious moves, right? Like, everybody okay. kind of made fun of pairing, paying Jeremy Grant $60 million. Everyone kind of made fun of uh, the uh, acquisition of like five centers across like two hours. It seemed like <laughs> free agency, but uh, I think what the new GM Troy Weaver has uh, said repeatedly that he is trying to build is a winning culture, and what that means for this Pistons team in particular is a team of guys who, despite the fact that they might lose a lot of games will continue to come out and, and play with effort and play hard and play intelligently every single night, uh, whether or not that mean that results in a win or loss. And so um, you bring in a bunch of high character guys like an Isaiah Stewart in the draft. You bring in, uh, they really prided themselves on like what Mason Plumlee brought uh, as a like big man educator for a guy like Killian Hayes and, and a pick and roll playmaker. Um, and so I think that there's a, there's a little bit, of uh, like curiosity as like how it's going to work. But at the same time, like the, this team is not going to be good, but they might like lose a lot of games the right way. And and that's what the team is looking to do. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like the sons of past four years, losing the games in the right way. You guys actually were rewarded. I really like Killian Hayes, but that (laughs) pick though, were you just super excited when he was picked? Cause I thought that was a great pick by you guys. Yeah, I was, I was very excited. Um, he was the guy I identified pretty early on in the draft process as a a great fit for the team. You know, even before they did the whole restructuring of the team, they, they needed a point guard. And even after this, they still needed a point guard. Uh, There are reports that he's going to start right away. So we're going to see what he's got uh, immediately, which I think is good. Um, But yeah, and he's just like a very long, very talented, very intelligent uh, point guard prospect. And so I'm, and he's being mentored by a former MVP and Derrick Rose. And mm-hmm. by all accounts, that's going really well. But, you know, it's training camp. Everything's going really well. No one's no one's done anything bad yet. Um, but but uh, I think Killian has a real opportunity to be a very special player uh, in today's league. Yeah, he's somebody that a lot of Suns fans were hoping would drop all the way to number 10. Obviously, we took Jalen Smith at number 10, with kind of which kind of shocked the fan base a little bit. But in Detroit, when Kay- you have Killian Hayes coming and joining the team, and in the same breath, you bid adieu to Langston Galloway, and now he's a member of the Phoenix Suns. Uh, when he joined the Pistons on that multi-year deal in June of 2017, what was the reaction by Pistons fans by that signing? Uh, there was a lot of uh, puzzlement, not because Langston is a bad player, but because at the time, I believe they hard-capped themselves to to sign him. Right, They signed him to the full mid-level exception. Um, at, at a time when they were like already pretty well over the salary cap. And so it was, uh, 
normally that's not the type of player you hard cap yourself for. Um, and that was kind of one of the hallmarks of the Stan Van Gundy era was uh, overpaying for free agents. And so uh, there was a lot of like curious puzzlement. Uh, there was also like they they signed Langston Galloway and drafted Luke Kennard in the same offseason. And so there was a little bit of like, okay, well, like how, how are those guys going to interact with one another? Um, how are those guys going to compete for playing time? And that never really was a concern. Uh, both guys ended up playing uh, really, really good rotation minutes. But uh, Langston was a, a consummate professional for the Detroit Pistons. He uh, he was loved by both Stan Van Gundy and Dwayne Casey for what he brought to the team. Um, he was a he was a willing shooter at a time when the team often needed like willing and accurate shooters, and he definitely was that. He was a great locker room dude. Uh, he had like some. Uh, they had like the breakfast club where like they would get up and like work out uh, <laughs> with him and some other guys on the team. And like, that was the, there was like the little team bonding experience thing. And uh, he's a great Instagram follow. I don't know if you guys have seen the shoes. Yes. The shoes are great. The shoes. Oh, the shoes, the shoes are great. You got a Matt's like shaking his head. No, like, yeah, I, was nah, like I, I didn't hear about that. Oh, the shoes. I, I was doing a lot of research today. Uh, I was actually on the, the Detroit bad boys SB nation site. And I was just looking at Langston Galloway, just to see what kind of you guys are writing about him and have written about him in the past. And that was the big thing was the shoes. And I was going through, I'm like, this is awesome. Like, I love a guy who brings that kind of that personality. And, and, you know, it's kind of like we used to have PJ Tucker on the team and he's another shoot guy. Yeah. yeah very also, similar, very similar vein. Yeah. I'm sorry. I missed out on that. I actually had no idea, but that's something I'm definitely going to check out after this. Do your podcast. research, Matthew. Jeez. Hey, that, I know the most important thing, the guy's shoes. Seriously. That's one of the <laughs> things I should have looked up, but he averaged. So last year he averaged like 26 minutes a game. I feel like that's quite a bit, uh, especially like signing with the Suns with a one year, $2 million contract. But was it just due to like a down year? Or did he like actually contribute like at a, his highest ability? You feel like last year? No, he was he was a real contributor for the team. Um, him and Bruce Brown, I think, were the two best uh, on ball defenders for the Pistons last year, which uh, is kind of like damning with faint praise because like normally those neither one of those guys is like an elite level defender, but they were both like very good and uh, very valued for that. Uh, Langston was also one of the uh, better shooters on the team last year. He shot, uh, I think he shot above 40% from three last season. That would make him and like Svima Kyaluk the only two, the only two guys on the roster to do so. And so, uh, yeah, there were a lot of nights when what Langston contributed in terms of uh, like good team, team defense, good on ball defense, and the ability to hit open shots. Like, there were a lot of nights when like that's what the Pistons really needed. And there were the occasional game where he would just get really hot, right? There was a game in Charlotte where he hit like six or seven threes. Yeah, seven um, threes, 31, he was, like, sorry, 32 off points. Down. Yeah, coming off pin downs and stuff, which is not normally how he gets points. But, like, if he's hot, he's feeling it. And he can definitely, like, you can also have, like, nights like that. And so, like, yeah, I definitely think he'll uh, be able to make an impact on this Phoenix team. Uh, the thing, the question I have is, like, him and Etwan Moore seems kind of duplicative, right? They do a lot of the same things. And so I'm curious to see how that kind of plays out in the rotation. Yeah, I think that'll be interesting, but I think that's how James Jones is kind of shoring up that depth, knowing that there's so many back-to-backs, the potential of COVID, and you definitely need somebody to come off the bench and spell Devin Booker primarily. I mean, uh, it looks like Linkson Galloway and Etwan Moore, they're not really playmakers per se. You know, they're more of two, I mean, Etwan Moore can sub in as a three if you need him to. So I think if you look at kind of how James Jones has constructed the roster, that's his approach to it. It's like, listen, we need to get depth in every position, knowing that this season is going to be a challenge from a depth standpoint. And then of course, Chris Paul's 35 and going on 36 and you don't know how long, you know, he's going to last or how long you're going to need to give him rest. So, uh, but as, as I listen to everything you're saying, Laz, are, are you going to miss him? I mean, that's one of those questions, you know, we get, we've got free agents in the past over the past decade where, you know, we'll talk to some of the, of the opposing fan base and, you know, we get Trevor Ariza and other, the Washington Wizards, and now you're, you have, enjoy them, have a good time. Like, are, are you going to miss Langston Galloway on your team? I, I am going to miss Langston Galloway on the team. Uh, I'm surprised all it took was the vet men to, to bring him in. Um, you know, with shooting as important as it is in today's NBA, I figured somebody would give him, you know, like a the room exception or the biannual or something. Um, but the combination of like plus shooter and plus locker room guy is something that I think the even the current iteration of the Pistons like could have used. 
so much so that like they brought in like Wayne Ellington on a vet minimum. And it's like, well, like you had Langston, like you could have just could have just done that. But uh, but yeah, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna miss Langston. He's a cool dude, good shooter, um, great locker room presence, like great, great in his role, right? And uh, you know, it doesn't hurt to get the Instagram engagement from the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> So it sounds like you were surprised they didn't resign him. Um, besides that, were you just surprised that the Phoenix Suns took him? That he was uh, this was a destination for him? No, I mean the the Suns bench could have used some more shooting last year, right? Um, I, I there and there are because like because of the role he plays as kind of like a three and D shooting guard. Um, there he could be very useful on like 30 NBA teams. So it, it wasn't a surprise to me that uh, he that he ended up in Phoenix just because it, like he could have gone anywhere. It was just like where he wanted to go, where he found, felt like he could have the most impact, probably play the most. And, you know, Phoenix is a good spot for him. You know, he's not it's like it's for like Cameron Payne and stuff, but like there, there definitely seems to be an avenue for him to get uh, rotation minutes. So, so you've covered him now for three years there. What's your favorite Langston Galloway story of, you know, throughout his entire duration with Detroit? Hmm. Favorite Langston Galloway story. So there was, uh, I think he's, so he's from Louisiana. I think he's from Baton Rouge, um, which is not new Orleans, but it's like close ish. Uh, but every, so every time he would come play in new Orleans, he would like he would have an amazing game. Um, they do like a TV package about like him like handing out backpacks and like uh, like pencils to the kids and stuff. He would always have like thirty people in the stands like cheering for him. Uh, like later on, um, his wife and like kid would be there and like they would get like their own little shout out and stuff. And so like it was always funny that you could kind of like pencil that in like whenever you saw like the at New Orleans on the schedule, like you knew you were going to get like a bunch of like Langston Galloway like content. And so like that, I think that's what I'll, and, and he always played well, right? Like he never, I can't recall a bad game he had in New Orleans. And so like, that was always kind of what I looked forward to on the season, like early on. It's like, okay, at New Orleans, like Lance is going to have a good night. Solid dude. It sounds like that's awesome. Yeah. Well, we talked a lot yeah. about, and, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say he, he gets more of those in the Western conference, right? And it's more yeah. than just once a year for him. Yeah. yeah. Well, it so, depends this year. I haven't. I yeah, I don't know what they might do. I think it's just two this year. Normally, yeah, it's three. Yeah, normally it's three with them. But um, you okay? So sounds like a great addition for the Suns. But is there anything that you want to tell us about, like maybe his weaknesses or the bad side of him or anything like that? Give us a heads up on. Yeah, he's just uh, he's kind of uh, limited in what he offers, right? Like if you need. Yeah. Some more like ball handling and shot creation. That's not really his forte. He got a little bit better about about that as the uh, as his Pistons career kind of went on. But that's still something that you you don't want to rely on. Um, he is like he is only six two, and so if you're out playing him out there in like a multi guard lineup or something, um, it it is kind of hampered by the fact that like he can't guard you know bigger wings or anything like that with uh, with ease. He'll compete against those guys definitely, but he'll be at a physical disadvantage. And he's not an uh, he's not an amazing finisher around the rim. He's got a good array of like floaters and push shots and uh, and uh, like the ability to take like shots in the mid range, but uh, just the, he's not like the most uh, he's, he's not like the most explosive athlete. Uh, he, it's not like the most uh, like crafty player around the rim. And so there will be times when like he, uh, he like blows some layups or like he can't quite get to the rim and he doesn't have the juice. And so uh, you'll be like, you know, like, eh, that's a little disappointing. But again, like for what you're signing him for and for what he, uh, for the type of player he is, like he's very, very useful. And so it's just don't, don't, uh, don't expect more than what he offers in that role. Well, I mean, considering we got him for as little as we did, I, you know, I'll I'll take anything he can, especially following him on Instagram and those shoes. I mean, everything kind of combined. It sounds like he's a solid dude. He's a good player. <laughs> can play some defense. Uh, good guy in the community. I mean, those are the kind of guys you want on the back end of your bench. And for the Suns, for so many years, the back end of the bench guys are those rookies who are 
you know, we're, it's the Ty Jerome's, the Elia Kobos, the guys who is just like, they're trying to find their way. Whereas it sounds like Lang- Langston Galloway is the guy who's already found his way and is going to be a solid addition to this lineup. Uh, Laz, one last question before we let you go. Should we expect to see an improved Pistons team this year? Oh, I don't know. Uh, depends on what you mean by uh, improved. Uh, they will, <laughs> they will definitely be different, but uh, no, I think this team is going to be in terms of like wins and losses. Like, no, this is probably going to be one of the uh, bottom three or four teams in the NBA. So no, you will not see oh. an improved Pistons team. So sadly. tag you're it basically, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you guys ascend, you guys, you know, compete for the playoffs, get in that play in series, right? Like uh, have everybody looking at you on NBA TV. Uh, we'll be very happy with our zero uh, national uh, nationally scheduled uh, TV games and uh, no one getting to see how hideous we are. Perfectly fine with that. God, that, that was we're re- last year. We're rebuilding. Okay. <laughs> We've been rebuilding for a decade. And I remember, you know, I think one of the frustrating things last year is we lost to you guys. I want to say twice in a row. I know we played the Pistons mm-hmm. last year. Um, Drummond's last game with you guys, and he just destroyed us. And like literally the next day, you traded him to Cleveland. I'm yep. like, come on, you couldn't have traded him one day earlier. Like we needed that win. Like had we won that game on down the line, we wouldn't. We, we would have been playing the Blazers to get into like the eighth seed. I mean, it's just uh, the butterfly effect. Yeah, oh. little things add up. Yeah, amen. Well, Laz, we really appreciate you being on the show. Can do me a favor for our uh, listeners. Can you tell people where they can follow both you and your work? Sure. No, absolutely. And again, thanks for having me on. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, you, Thank you. People can follow me on Twitter at Laz Chance. That's at L-A-Z-C-H-A-N-C-E. Uh, you've already mentioned Detroit Bad Boys a bunch, and I appreciate that. But yeah, you can find uh, all my written work on DetroitBadBoys.com. I host two podcasts about the Pistons. I host the Detroit Bad Boys podcast, which is affiliated with the Detroit Bad Boys site. I also host the Pistons versus Everybody podcast on the Blue Wire Podcast Network. Heck yeah. Well, again, Laz, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day and coming hanging out with us. And if you ever need a couple of guys to talk sons with you on one of your pods, just hit us up, all right? Appreciate it. All right. Take care. Thank you. Well, that's that's great news. Again, you know, that's the fourth interview we've had with somebody talking about a new member joining the phoenix suns and everybody has high praise and and again that's where i'm kind of in this mystic aura right now that always occurs at the beginning of every season right like even these pat every beginning of the last 10 seasons even if we know that the suns aren't really going to do much we're in that period of hope right now it's the same period or it's the same feeling you get when you draft your fantasy football team am i right you draft your team, you're excited, except for you, Matthew, <laughs> yeah. when you take like three tight ends in the first five rounds. <laughs> but yeah, that's you playing around. You know? But but you ex- you're excited. You're like, okay, we're, it's us against the world, baby. Like, yeah. let's do this. And we're on the precipice of that right now. We're getting ready to take on the Utah Jazz in the preseason, and everything is pointing upwards for the Phoenix Suns fan base. So, hearing what Laz had to say about Langston, how confident is uh, does that make you in the back end of this Suns? lineup and rotation oh even more confident but it's just strange to hear this because like you said you mentioned during the interview we have these players like elio kobo uh any kind of rookie um what ty jerome when he would come off the bench you just don't know what to expect we know what to expect from these guys and what's the best part is like every time we've had these interviews the guys are good locker room guys the shoe thing i gotta look up but they're always good positive locker room guys that goes way further than a lot of things that show up on the stat the stat sheet, you know, because honestly, I mean, that might be just who he is. He might not get a lot of minutes, but he can be that guy on the vet minimum that comes in and really helps the team in the locker room. Not that we don't need it, because I feel like with Chris Paul and uh, Jay Crowder, that's going to help out a lot too in the locker room. But just having these guys at the end of the bench doing the same thing, that's that's a big plus for me, dude. And I, I'm super excited. I mean, I feel like going into this year, especially with Chris Paul being on the JJ Reddit podcast, it's like you're not used to the Suns players going into the season and going on these podcasts. You're like, are you sure you want Chris Paul on? He plays for the Suns. Yeah, he's a son like, now. You remember he's a son now. Why would you want him on? It's very cool to listen to, especially the way po- how positive he is. Absolutely. And uh, shout out to everybody who's in the chat currently watching. Uh, we'll go through a few of the comments. And if you are not in the chat and you're listening on the Bright Side of the Podcast Network, uh, make sure you subscribe, rate, and review. If And, and join us during a live stream during, on YouTube. It's a, it's a good time. You can interact with the show. And yeah. if you do, please subscribe and hit the bell 
when we go live, you'll know. Um, Blaze Megatron, uh, how's a good idea to put winners on a losing team? They'll have to learn to lose and, mo- and may not take it well. Um, that's interesting because that's how the Suns kind of operated for a while. We tried to bring yeah. in different guys. Tyson Chandler is a great example of that. How he's he's won a championship. He came to the, the Phoenix Suns, and you're hoping that they can produce winning, but all that eventually happens when they continue to lose is they continue to learn how to lose. So <laughs> are they um, ask for a way out? Yeah, that's they, what they do. Yeah. They, they, yeah. Uh, Mugshot gaming in YouTube. Can't remember the last time I was excited for a season to start. And I think this is echoed. Like I I'm with you, Mug. Like yeah. I'm so amped and jazzed. I mean, for <laughs> example, this upcoming Saturday is the, is the jazz. And, uh, my, my, my fiance is like, you know, zoo lights is going on in Phoenix. Would you want to oh come? I'm like, God. I'm like, do I have to like the oh, preseason's on? Wow. I'm going to be on my phone, I guess. God, God I totally forgot. Yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll sh- kick me sh- off the podcast. Yeah. Shan First said, game I don't have year. to go. Oh my God. So dude. yeah, I think that'll be, uh, How dare you? <laughs> let's see. I had a couple more in here. I wanted to get to before we start talking about the Utah jazz, um oh this is great again blaze megatron i think galloway could back up cp3 for short stints so long as dario sarge is on the floor yes i'm down for point dario that is a fantastic observation that's something that the suns are going to have to explore how they're going to generate playmaking when cp3 and devin booker both off the floor point dario is a possibility my friend it is. I mean, we saw it in the bubble, but honestly, he was a drive and kick guy. But towards the end, he wasn't as much. I feel like he was trying to score a little bit, but he's still that guy that's going to drive and like kind of create a crowd. I feel like he creates a crowd by tripping over everybody, getting to the hoop, and then he can dish it out. So that's going to be something I got to look for, too. I, I Didn't Dario Sarge, too? He's looking forward to playing a little bit of point Dario, too. He said that, I feel like. Yeah, he, he knows I think he's embracing he his role this year, and that's uber important. And, and like you said, like, we don't need him to drive to the lane. We don't need him to, you know, run a high screen and roll with somebody. We just need him to bring the ball up the court and assist in that 0.5 second offense and make the right decision. And I think that he's somebody who has that capability. You know, we don't need him to be Booker coming off screens, trying to, you know, get the ball and shoot. You know, you're never going to get that from unathletic Dario Sarge. But if you have somebody who can assist in a little bit of playmaking when both CP3 and Booker are off, that's going to be something that just, it continues to add to that, the depth of the team. Yeah, that's going to be Javon Carter this year. It's just my uh, guess. But yeah, yeah I think so, too. I think so, too. Mm-hmm. And campaign. I mean, again, the depth on this team, although we talked about it with Espo on our last podcast, you know, the playmaking ability from the guard position minus our front court or our backcourt starters is going to be a challenge. And that's one thing we'll have to just kind of see play out. And as, you know, the first time we're going to have an opportunity to see that play out is in the preseason, baby. Here we go. Okay, so the first game is the Suns at the Jazz on Saturday, 7 p.m. on Fox Sports, Arizona. Matthew won't be watching it. He'll be looking at zoo lights in <laughs> oh at God. the zoo. So have fun and wear your mask, life. bro. My whole life is over. What am I supposed to do when the playoffs are on and I make these kind of dumb decisions, dude? I don't know. Your priorities are all fucked up, man. Like, just... Yeah. Let's just agree <laughs> agree on that. Yeah. So what what are your thoughts in general about the preseason every year? Oh, every year it's kind of different for basketball. I feel like you kind of get more of a feel of what the team's gonna be because they're all on the court. Preseason football, none of the starters play, but preseason basketball, you see it a lot. In the past, the Suns would play their game, their which their game is getting their their ass whooped. That's what it was in the preseason, it would carry on to the regular season. I feel like we're gonna see a lot um of good stuff, but just stuff that it's brought to you by the new players and things that we want to see on the court and what we expect from these new signings, you know, the scoring, like we said, and maybe even just seeing like the playmaking as well, which we just talked about, but dude, preseason and basketball, it could be thought of as nothing, but sometimes something, it depends how amped you are for the season. I I'm amped for it. I feel like I'm going to put everything into these preseason games besides going to new lights. Like I did in the bubble pregames. The bubble pregames were sort of balling out, and they didn't go. Oh, hell yeah. That was a yeah. good time. Those warm-up games, they, they kicked some butt. Yeah, and then they continued that into that 8-0 uh, bubble run. I think they only lost one game their entire yeah. time in the bubble, and it was, I think, the last preseason game or the second to last. Uh, but I'm with you. you know, the, the preseason for me is never something that I'm overly excited about. Uh, it is exciting when you have – a new rookie like DeAndre Ayton and you want to see just who this guy really is. You know, summer league's one thing you get an opportunity to see these guys play in a muted fashion, uh, but not with your star players. So 
this year obviously is much different because there's only going to be four preseason games. It's going to be fast and quick. You know you're not going to get a lot of uh, look at the 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 first team, but you're going to get plenty, as you mentioned, of that second team and to see who those potential playmaking guards could be. And I think that uh, that's going to be one of the big things that I'm looking for this preseason is to see who's going to be the playmakers, what kind of offensive sets Monty's going to run with Chris Paul and DeAndre Ayton and Booker and how they're going to kind of learn to instinctually play off each other and see if, see if that instinctual play is there. You know, if I've seen it before with basketball teams and obviously the Suns have put forth a lot of shitty teams out there in the past 10 years where you go into the preseason watching them and it's just fumbling, bumbling, stumbling. And, and, and that's okay. I mean, that's, that's what the preseason's for. It's when that uh, stumbling and bumbling bled into the regular season that it started to be kind of frustrating. You're like, okay, these guys aren't learning. I really feel with, like somebody with CP3 who demands respect, who has got a, a great offensive basketball IQ, uh, it's going to bleed into those other players around him, and they're going to start to see that game differently. It all starts with the preseason. So I'm interested to just, uh, like, again, I, I'll, I'll end where I began. I normally don't care about the preseason as much as I do right now. And mm -hmm. there's multiple multiple reasons why, just as it is for every other Suns fan right yeah. now. You just gambled it. You ended where you began. That's a lot of things I do in this podcast where I don't have a good point, but I'll just reverse it in the end. But um, yeah, and don't think that Chris Paul, they're going to take these games for granted. This is going to be a lot of work. Like they're like they're doing right now in the new training facility. All you mm -hmm. hear is good stuff. And they're right there. They're going to work. It's intense. Of course, we're not, no one's really able to watch, but you know, from what we're hearing from the little people that are inside, it's already starting. So from these preseason games of four games, it's going to be unbelievable to actually see Chris Paul just already working up a sweat. Devin Booker, it, just a squint in his eyes, him and CP3 going at each other. It's going to be crazy. It's going to start preseason game one when I'm at Zoo Lights. <laughs> I won't mention it again. <laughs> what, uh, yeah, what, what players, player players are you going to be keeping yeah. your eye on? All the new guys, I think besides Chris Paul and Jay Crowder, I just want to see where the new guys fit. We've done four podcasts, all great stuff. Um, Langston Galloway, each one more. Uh, you know, these guys, where they're going to fit and how they're going to play. Um, what's up? I didn't see that one. Sorry. No, I'm. Uh, oh, yeah. Jalen. Yeah. Jalen. Yeah. 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 No. Um, but I think just the additions, what Monte went out and went to go get for cheap. These guys are coming in for cheap. How much are they going to prove to get these minutes in preseason? I feel like if they put up a good show in preseason, it'll add to the regular season and get those minutes extended because you have to go through Javon Carter and campaign too to get those. But yeah, just the added guards. I'm excited to see them play, especially when you watch like a lot of YouTube clips of these guys. You kind of get an understanding, but once you actually see them play instead of clips, you get more of an understanding why why they were went out, why um, James Jones went out to get these guys and why Monty wanted them as well because they're going to fit within the offense, defense, how they flow from one end to the other, what it's going to look like that way. That's exciting for me because you just don't know. You don't know because watching YouTube clips, you can't. You just get the threes, the catch and shoot threes, everything they make, all the dunks, but I just want to see the good stuff, the, the stuff you don't see on YouTube. I'm really looking forward to Etwan Moore. I really like everything I'm hearing from e about Etwan Moore from players, from people who cover him. Um, it's just every everything around him sounds really interesting to me. And you know, like I said earlier, like he could potentially play in those small guard lineups as your three because he has the length. I, I, he, he's also going to wear number fifty five, so that already like I saw the photo shoots today, and like that looks fucking sick on a jersey. Like, Did you see I, him in one? I didn't yeah, get to see that one. Yeah, I, I, I wish I had a picture I could pull up. Uh, but he looked great in him. Like the, the 55 just looks sick. Um, and it's also going to be interesting, like how soon we forget. Like, so do you know what number Langston uh, Galloway is going to be wearing? Uh, 23. I'm just kidding. I'm no. really bad at this game. What is he going to play? Don't he, ask he's, me he, he's wearing number two. So okay. Elio Kobo, bye. And then Jalen Smith, I'm not going to ask you, but Jalen Smith, Smith, Smith is going to wear number 10. Like Ty Jerome. So it's like, boom, we turn those numbers over quick. So it's going to be cool to see the same numbers, but with like players who potentially have higher talent in it. And that's one of those things I also like about the preseason, to your point of getting to know the new guys. This is your yeah. first opportunity to see them in a Suns jersey. You know, all those highlights we've been watching once we heard that these guys were members of the team are on, are wearing different uh, fabrics and it's going to be wearing the Valley stuff and it's going to be really exciting. So, and how soon uh, we forget those other guys with those other numbers? Yeah. Right? Ty Jerohu. Remember the TIE Fighters, Matthew? 
the Tie Fighters. Yeah, the Tie yeah. Fighters. Ty Jerome and uh, Tyler Ty Johnson. Johnson. Tyler yeah. Johnson. Yep. Matthew dubbed them the Tie Fighters, and they instantly they tanked. Anywhere. They got zapped. <laughs> oh, blew up right away at the desktop. Um, the, the the Suns' first uh, opponent is the Jazz. What are your thoughts on the Utah Jazz entering this season? Like, did they get better, worse, or stay the same in your research, your extensive research? Oh, dude, my research on these guys, no. They actually, they're like the same team running it back again. I feel like this is their year where either they get over the hump where it's like four years in the playoffs, lost in the second round, two years in a row with uh, Ricky Rubio on one of those teams. And then you have the next two years of losing in the first round, including last year. Mm -hmm. So it's like either they get over this hump or else I'm going to do the Kevin O'Connor thing where they blow it up. Because honestly, they they have their group back. They, they really, I didn't see any, they had like, I think they got graded like an A minus from a lot of mm -hmm. websites on their off season, but they just brought people back. And I think that you can see that this is the one year where they bring back favors. They bring back Clarkson. They liked what they had in the bubble. I feel like they were so close. I think you picked them. Oh, excuse me. Over the nuggets um, in the first, first round. And they were so close to getting by them. They yeah. could have probably did more damage. And they were that close where I think it's just, this is the one year we get to bring it back. And I think that, are they better than the Nuggets? I think they're better than the Nuggets. They could be. They go on streaks during I the season where so. it's like, I'm saying like during the season, they could be during streaks because they look like the second or third best teams in the West sometimes. But that's how I think of them. It's just like, they either they bring it back, they take it to the next level, or the year after this, it's over. And I don't see them getting past anybody in the West really unless uh, Donovan Mitchell, what is my problem? Donovan Mitchell <laughs> is that guy who we saw in the bubble where his game went up another notch, just like Booker, and he can actually be the leader of this team. But uh, who knows? It's really up to him. Yeah, I don't I don't really know what to think of the Jazz this year. I think they're a team that is getting their normal kind of press. Utah doesn't get a lot of press. And they're, they're going to be a solid team. But I think that, whereas I talk about Devin Booker and DeAndre Ayton and Mikael Bridges, Cam Johnson, all these guys are uh, a year better, not a year older. Rudy Gobert is a year older. And I think that his style of play is slowly, you know, he if he loses half a step, he's going to be a really different player up there. And it is going to come down to Donovan Mitchell and how he plays and can he carry that same type of performance that he had in the bubble night in and night out. It's going to be tough, man. I mean, it's a physical game and he's a little bit of a smaller dude. Um, so I'm interested to see how that is. But to your point, you know, they brought back Derek Favors. They got Jordan Clarkson. So they have a nice supporting cast around there. Uh, they're, they're a team that we definitely need to continue to monitor throughout the season because they're a team who we might be vying for a playoff spot with. And, and, and my hope is we perform better than they do. We have more depth than they do. And we have the ability to surpass them in the standings this year because I just, I'm not a big jazz fan. Never really have been, you know, they've never really done anything. The suns to really hurt my feelings, but they're a team that is, I, there's kind of blah, you know, they're just kind of, I'm not a big fan of, Donovan Mitchell in any way, shape, yeah. or form. Rudy Gobert is uh, patient zero. Uh, he's he just kind of lumbers down. You know, he he gets the the all defense stuff, and it's like he's the guy who I think DeAndre Ayton is going to replace on the all defensive team at center. I really do. Yeah, eventually in the future, maybe even the all star. Oh wait, Gobert hasn't made the all star game. Oh, wait, did he yeah. make it last year finally or no? I forget. I he, think he, he did. always had a hard yeah he always had a hard time making it in and crying about it. But um, Aiden would sure replace him in the All Star game. But dude, the Utah Jazz, like you said, are bland. They just they're those hot team where it's just like you'll listen to a Bill Simmons podcast or something. Be like, you know what, Utah? Yeah, if I had to bet my life on it, I'd pick them to win the championship. That's what they look like in the season sometimes. But I never buy into it. They're a little bit overrated. Um, but I love Donovan Mitchell this year. I know people give him shit, and Suns fans hate him. In the hate Utah, of course, but I think Mitchell's well, going to... Like, but but think of where that comes from. That comes from people always rating Donovan Mitchell higher than Devin Booker. And yeah. ESPN put out their top 100 players. And if you want to hear a great uh, recap of that, go ahead and visit Fanning the Flames. Their podcast on the Bright Side of the Sun Network, they did a great job of going through the ESPN top 100 in relative to Phoenix Suns. I think a lot of that hate for Donovan Mitchell is going to subside because Devin Booker outranks him by like seven or eight now. You know, before it was like Devin Booker is four or five behind Donovan Mitchell. Now, according to ESPN and, and also according to CBS's top 100, he outranks them. So there's no longer that rivalry. It's kind of like, OK, what's always helped Donovan Mitchell is the fact that he's been part of a winning team. Now, Booker, who's always been a better player, is finally expected to win. Therefore, the national narrative is he is a better player. So I feel like that rivalry yeah. is going to fall less. I don't hate Donovan Mitchell. I just I don't like 
some of his uh, antics, I guess, on the court. But that's because he doesn't play oh, for yeah. me. You know, that's typical. It's like CP3. I was never been as I've never been a big CP3 fan because of his antics yeah. on the court. Now he's on my side. Do I fucking love him? Yeah, but Donovan, but I'm glad you brought that up. He's like that fake toughness guy. Like in the bubble, he was screaming at nobody. Yes. Like, what? Ah. yeah, he was just basically screaming after every shot he made. Like just showing how intense he is and how seriously he took this game. Just in case you didn't know, that's the way he is. Yeah. So uh, a couple questions we'll bring up from the chat. Uh, Alex on YouTube. How much do you think the starters are going to play in the preseason, Matthew? I think at least a half. I think, honestly, they're going to go maybe more than a half. What I think I really, from what I remember in the playoff or in the preseason for NBA is you got to get a good look at these guys playing and they got to get those reps in dude, before the season start. Cause in the West, every win and every loss matters mm -hmm. this year. So I think they're going to at least be more than a half. I would say about what? 70% of the game. I, that's what I'm saying. Well, I think that you? first game against the jazz, it's going to be probably like 16 to 20 minutes for the starters. I really do. They just, you got to get the starters, their legs underneath them. They'll be playing the jazz a couple nights later, and we'll probably see that kind of increase to it. And then they have the two against the Lakers where I think that they might get a half in uh, maybe a little bit into, you know, over third, over the third quarter. So we'll see. I mean, that's just kind of, again, it's a, a shortened season and it's, load management and Chris Paul and there's all these different factors. So it's going to be really interesting to see how Monty uh, uh, balances all of that. Uh, Iverson yeah. vlogs. Are we going to see Jalen with goggles? Fucking a, I hope so, man. I love the goggle. Look. I love it too. I don't know why people knock it so much, man. Um, Bo outlaw. I'm uh, not Bo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Bo Bo Outlaw. Outlaw. Is he the last one? Was he the last one to wear them? But I, I, I think, think they so. look good, dude. I want to know the story behind it. Maybe he gets migraines like I do and he needs to wear these special goggles on the court because of the lighting. Who knows? But I think he looks badass. When too. you're at Zoo Lights, will you be wearing goggles? Yes, I will. Okay. I'm going to be wearing those glasses where it looks like I'm asleep. Oh, and nice. Just really watch my phone, but walking around, <laughs> that makes no sense. All right. <laughs> Coda Kid, the goggles is what I'm looking forward to. I think yeah. a lot of us are. Um, and then the last one I want to bring up, let's see here. Uh Rob uh, Robert Christie on YouTube. He said, got to get those reps with the starting unit. And that's kind of to our point. I think that they'll kind of progress it, but, uh, but it's preseason yeah. basketball, you know, we're hyped, but remember none of it counts and it's sun's basketball. So we're excited no matter what. Yes, sir. All right. It's time for one of our favorite segments. Thoughts. In the middle of our um, brains. All right. So we're going to talk about some of those things. Always. This is our segment for, talking about things that are kind of happening in the NBA, right? So uh, first off, Kelly Oubre was on the All the Smoke podcast with Matt Barnes and Steven Jackson. If you haven't listened to that podcast, it's a quality listen. It's yes. one of those things, uh, actually, when the quarantine was happening, I was driving around delivering liquor for a liquor store uh, just to kill time, really. And all I did was listen to like all the All the Smoke podcasts with Tracy McGrady, with, I mean, they're just, they're fantastic. Sure. Steve Nash. A+. Plus. A plus. Um, so if, uh, you listened obviously to, to this yeah. week's interview, right? Yes. So what I'm going to do is I'll play a couple of clips from it and then we'll talk about it. Sound good? Yes. So we're almost two years to the point where you were traded from Washington to Phoenix, Washington, a team in the playoffs going to Phoenix where a team that's trying to find an identity, beautiful city. I love it out there. A young star in Devin Booker who you came in the league with and, and had been playing against. What was it like to understand that like that was really your first taste of the business? Like, damn, mm -hmm. they drafted me. Now I'm off to Phoenix. Right. What was that experience like for you? Man, every everything, you know, every trade that I've been a part of, man, it's really just been like, like, a, like a what the fuck moment for real. Like, because, mm -hmm. you know, in, in Washington, I got traded after the Brooklyn game and all my teammates crowded around me and was just you know, consoling, like they come into, you know, pretty much my need because they knew that I was a young kid who really didn't understand the business of it. So, you know, I, I appreciate Markeith, John, Brad, everybody who really just helped me out through that first trade. Uh, and, you know, I get to Phoenix and I'm I'm motivated to really just show that I, I don't ever want to be traded again, like for real. And I get to Phoenix and, you know, it's all love from the city, from the organization, from the franchise. And, you know, obviously, you know, I got traded for, two weeks ago and it was another moment towards I had just had a killer workout too like I was just feeling really good showing them that I'm about to go off this season and then you know after my workout I come out and everybody like yo check Twitter I'm like I don't look at I ain't finna look at no Twitter man y'all just tell me where I'm going like that's what I had told Frank Kaminsky 
And then, you know, it was just like, damn, like I keep getting moved. But at the end of the day, it's the. Anybody who uh, appreciates Marquise Morris, I don't know if I trust them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. That's what what, what, what are your right? thoughts on kind of, you know, because that's where we're really hearing Kelly talk about how it went down. You know, there's he was on a radio show and he talked about it a little bit. And, you know, we're almost at that point. We're very close. And this is kind of putting the nail in the coffin on Kelly Oubre because I think it's time that we move on from Kelly Oubre. Um, but what are your kind of thoughts on how he felt it was handled? Well, he feels he's kind of hurt still. I mean, you can hear it in his voice. I mm -hmm. mean, I mean, that's just the way he talks maybe, but he, he'll get straight to Phoenix. He wants to talk about how he wants to be here and how he wanted to stay here and make this his place. But it's like, dude, you weren't anything really till you came to Phoenix. I mean, your game went up such a big notch coming into Phoenix. That's the first step, Kelly. It's the first step. And then after that, then you continue it to another team and then you try to stay there, but you trying to like build something from some other place and worry about getting traded. That's going to be a distraction, man. That's going to be a huge distraction on your game and on the court and off the court. I know he brings that energy, but he needs to focus dude. Cause he thinks he's going to be great and he can be, but he, the, the insecurity, the stuff he keeps bringing up over and over again of just being traded. It sucks. Yeah, it does suck, but you're in the NBA dude. And you weren't really anything before you were in Phoenix. So just keep it going, dude. It's a new building block here with the warriors. So he's on the right track. He just needs to keep it, keep it silent. And like we said before, like keep your head down, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, keep your head down like Devin Booker does, you know? Yeah, and, and I think that that is one of those things that Kelly Oubre wants to be a cornerstone of a franchise. He, he wants to feel like he's part of something special and that he, and that he's going to stay there. You know, if, if you listen to the whole podcast uh, with Matt Barnes and Steven Jackson, they're, they're talking about how he grew up in new Orleans and hurricane Katrina displaced him. And, you know, it's always moving around and moving around. So he wants to feel like he's at home. Yeah. And, and part of that is he, he feels like he has the skill set necessary to become a franchise player. And he learned a lot of that from book. He actually mentioned that a little bit later in the interview. How fun was your brief experience playing alongside him? Cause you guys really made some noise for that team. For me to be with him, you know, for those two years and learn that, you know, he was a franchise guy there. He put in the work and he put up the numbers and everything to be who he is. It just showed me that I'm, I'm not too far. You know what I'm saying? I got to keep mm -hmm. working. Cause at the end of the day, I see my peer, who is really doing, you know, what I, what, something that I would love to do. And I'm going to just keep working, just keep my head down. But at the end of the day, I was there to, you know, be a, a supporting role in, the, in that cast. And at the end of the day, like, that's the way I got to continue to just work. But he doesn't really put his head down, does he? No, he doesn't. He's looking at the other guy. This one thing when you are insecure and you're trying to focus on something and get ahead of the person next to you, don't look at them. Do your own thing. You're going to get there. But he is a supporting. What's wrong with that being a supporting role? You're not going to be, and I'm not going to say like just shoot down any dreams he has, but you're not going to be the superstar Devin Booker is probably. I mean, if you're support, if you're the third best guy on a team, that's pretty damn good for Kelly Oubre, who was thought of as pretty much nothing, just probably trade bait. Some guys can be moved around the league, but now if he wants to build something with the Warriors and not be traded, just, dude, don't look at the other guys, man. You have an opportunity to be the third best player on this team and just go there and try to do it. And like Robert Christie says in the chat, I feel for Kelly, but the Suns had to get better and they did. Yeah, And that's what it comes down to. It's a business. And I don't know how far Kelly is off from being a Devin Booker. You know, I think he thinks he might be closer than he is. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, Kelly Oubre, when he comes back to Phoenix, we will cheer for him. Yeah. I, I, I love Kelly Oubre, and it was hard to see him go. It's the debate we talked about on this podcast at nauseum this entire summer is should he stay or should he go? And ultimately, he had to go. And, you know, R.I.P. Kelly Oubre is a son. It's time. The Suns Jam Session podcast. We're moving on from it. Okay? No more Kelly talk. Last. Until we play Golden State. Then that's all we'll talk about. <laughs> yep. um, keeping it more internalized and talking about um, the players who are now here, Chris Paul was on J.J. Reddick's podcast, and that was a fantastic podcast to listen to. Uh, what's the name of his podcast? It's like an old man in the three. Old man in the three, yep. Yeah, and J.J. Reddick, I mean, he's – born to podcast. He's on the ringers uh, podcast network. Um, but he had Paul on and I wanted to bring up just a little part of that interview to kind of fortify what we've been talking about forever. You know, is this becoming a destination? Yes. You know, clearly Chris Paul's coming here. Why is it becoming a destination? This is the important part. We got such a great group of guys and you know how long, how far that goes, you know, like that goes a long way. Like it's one thing to be able to do what you love in the hoop, but to be around like people that you genuinely like and enjoy, like, that's, that's the best part. Like, we got Etuan Moore here. You play with 
I played with him in Orlando and in New Orleans. One of the greatest dudes ever. Oh, man. Like, having him on our team, like, when I saw that, like, when I saw that sign, I was like, hell yeah. You know, like, somebody that I, I've never known, like, the only conversation me and him have ever had, like, was playing against each other during a game, but somebody that I was excited as hell when I heard he was going to be my teammate, you know, because of that respect factor. Same thing with Langston Galloway. I feel like the, the, the one familiarity for you is Monty, of course. Right. And, uh, you know, you played for him in, in New Orleans. How, what, what were sort of the factors that made Phoenix specifically such an attractive trade destination for you? Um, obviously, Book had a lot to do with it. You know what I mean? Book and uh, the young pieces, obviously, DeAndre Ayton. Um, but then Mont, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, that's that's it right there. And, and you know, the, the aura is about to to we're about to come back to reality preseason starts in two days they will be there will be challenges no team goes 72 and 0 okay the suns go 8 and 0 in the bubble but no team's going to go 72 and 0 there's going to be peaks there's going to be valleys and but going into it there's just so much more confidence around this team hearing chris paul who is revered around this league be excited about etwan moore langston galloway coming and joining him does nothing but fortify our faith in this team moving forward. Yeah. And uh, take that, Elmino Hassan. Seriously, like, <laughs> I'll never forget two years ago when Booker said, I want to, this isn't really maybe a super team, but this is, these are players that are superstars that want to come to the Suns. I mean, one player right now, and all you hear is a lot of players want to come to Phoenix, but it was thought of a joke two years ago. Now it's for real. And everybody wants to be here because it's a winning culture now, man. And Chris Paul just bringing up him being excited about acquisitions. That, that's yes, it. that's why yeah. I had to play that that clip. I love that. You never heard that before, ever. No, not like never. that. Not when he's about to like jump up in the air. You know, something yeah, like he's, that. He's, that's, like, dude, each one more is on the team. You know, yeah. so I just can't wait till next season when JJ Reddit comes here on like a veteran minimum because he just wants to play with CP3 for one last run. I mean, oh, that's, that's who, who who knows. But uh, so obviously a lot to be excited. Um, a couple things we can talk about just real quick before we end the podcast pertaining to the NBA. What? G- give me your elevator speech real quick on the James Harden saga. What What do you think about everything that's going on there in Houston right now? Well, I've always been a James Harden defender. Um, honestly, this is something I don't mind. I I know it's really weird. He's like at the strip clubs and stuff, not coming to camp. But these are this is how players get out, and he wants out. I mean, no matter what he says, I think he flip flops. He says he wants to be in Houston. Now he's like, I want to go to the Bucks, wherever yeah. else. But it's just like I don't blame him. I mean, I know he's making a ton of money, but if he wants out, this is how he gets out. So I don't blame him at all, and I hope he goes somewhere else. My prediction, I really think, and like KOC actually brought it up, but I really thought that maybe like New Orleans would be a place for him to go. I know it's crazy. They have the like assets. They have the assets, and then playing next to Zion, maybe that'd be good enough for him. But he he will get traded, and I don't blame him for doing what he's doing. He can have fun, do whatever the hell he wants with his money. Uh, but what do you think, man? I mean. Is this something you would condemn or no? Not necessarily condemn, but I don't like this continual precedent of players forcing themselves out because we have a player who potentially, if we don't perform this season or next, could potentially do the same thing. And now there is a blueprint of this continually happening. Uh, Bill Simmons really went over it very well in his last podcast, going over the, the, the history of players forcing themselves out and how the only guys who really stayed, like Hakeem Olajuwon who wanted out, and a couple other names ended up going on and winning world championships with their teams. Um, but with Anthony Davis, I mean, once it happened with Anthony Davis, I really became worried because, you know, he's a Kentucky guy. Booker's a Kentucky guy. I don't know if they've, you know, they probably are in the same circle. So those kind of conversations happen. And then James Harden wanting out does set, set a bad precedent or it fortifies what is already a bad precedent, in my opinion. I do like the fact that he does want to go to the East, though. Like, as a, as a, fan of a team that fights and claws is going to have to try to navigate this tough West. Like, yeah, man, go to the 76ers, go to Brooklyn, go to the bucks. Don't go to the, go, don't go to new Orleans, you know, don't stay in the West, but go out East, man. Like do whatever you want. Join the Celtics. I don't give a shit. Become a Hornet. I don't care. <laughs> Just go to the Eastern conference because that's going to make that path for the Suns even easier to avoid that number yeah. seven seed. Cause I want the Suns to be six or higher. My prediction is four. I want them to be six and higher. So we don't have to fuck with the play in game. 
Yeah, but when he he's been in Houston for so long, dude, I feel like it gets to the point where it's like even as a watcher or viewer, it's like I'm sick of watching Houston. I'm sick of watching that. I love James Harden's game. I know a lot of people hate it, but in Houston with the color, with there's no fans this year, but the fans showing up late, all that shit. I'm just I'm done with that. It's kind of got to the point where like when if Steve Nash was here, you know, and we're not winning all this bullshit, and he asked for out, it's like that's fine. But like that's just the way it is now. So. I mean, he'll probably get out. I think he's going to be traded. Honestly, um, what do you think? Ninety percent sure he'll be out. Yeah, I mean, if it's not by the beginning of the season, like mid-season, he's gone. Like, there's just no yeah. way. And what's unfortunate for the Ross for the Rockets is he's a diminishing asset because he wants out, and it's so public. It's like the Suns dealt with like Markeith Morris and and you know everybody else, Eric Bledsoe. You know, we didn't get. We got pennies on the dollar for him because it was known that they wanted out. Uh, I do got to give this one up. Coda Kid in the chat. Become a wizard. Yes. Go join Russell Westbrook in Washington. That'd be fantastic. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about NBA-wise was Paul George signing the max deal with the Clippers. <laughs> what does that tell you, Matthew? What What do you think? After all that crap talking he essentially did on the All the Smoke podcast about Doc Rivers, and then he signs the max with the Clippers, what, what do you think in there? That means it was all the coach, right? That means it, it was all be. Doc Rivers. Rivers is out. He re-signed him to the max, uh, Paul George. I mean, he eventually would get paid that, I feel like. But just the way the season ended is terrible. But this year is basically, I don't know if you can trade that contract, but this Not is this why year. I'm probably going to pick the Clippers this year to go to the finals instead of the Lakers, just because of what all they should have probably been there in the first place last year. But this year, they have they have to put it all in, dude, and make it to the playoffs. Play all 72 games. Get that team going. But, I mean, I don't – good for him, right? That yeah, the, the again, I, I look at this through the lens of a Phoenix Suns fan. It's like, fuck, Paul George is going to be in our, uh, n- not only in our conference, but in our division now for, you know, another four or five years potentially. And that's always something that you don't like to see after Anthony Davis just signed with the Lakers. Now, Paul George is, is with the Clippers. It's like, man, it's just, it's always an uphill battle in that Pacific division in the NBA. So that yeah. that's the way I looked at it. Uh, I, I do think a lot of people are discounting the Clippers, you know, based on what happened in the bubble. That's a tough mental environment to navigate. Paul George admitted he had a hard time doing it. They didn't perform well. And now because Montrose Harrell left and not a lot of, you know, Serge Ibaka essentially came and is going to fill that role. And they didn't make a, a ton of splash moves this offseason. Everybody's like, oh, they're, they're going to fall off. Remember uh, Le, uh, LeBron James in the heat? Remember how year one they couldn't get it done? Now, granted, they went to the finals, but they lost. Year two, they were just fine. And I'm not yeah. saying that the Los Angeles Clippers are the Miami Heat of 2011 or 12, but I'm saying, like, just d- don't sleep on those Clippers, man. They're still good. I don't, I'm not saying that anybody yeah. really is, but, I mean, that team's going to be really good, man. And now we have to deal with Paul George for, like, five years. Yeah, and if you thought last year was hard with the bubble, this year's going to be even worse because it's an uphill battle to get over that 3-1 deficit that you had and you didn't take advantage of it. And now you got to go back into the playoffs again. And if that happens again... We'll see what happens, dude, because that is going to take a toll mentally on him. Yeah. So uh, we'll see. We'll see. Hey, but, at least good this year. Yeah. Man, well, exactly. <laughs> at least we're come, We're showing up to the fight and we have more than, you know, like a, a popsicle stick. You know, we're showing up to a fight where they have machine guns <laughs> yeah. and we got like a popsicle stick. And we're like, let's get in this thing. Like, you know, we're upgraded. At least we got a handgun now, you know? So that we got that going for us, which is nice. We do. All right, let's 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 hit one mailbag question. Uh, reminder yes. to everybody out there: you can email us at sunsjamsession at gmail dot com. Uh, you can visit sunsjamsession dot com, or you can hit us up on Twitter at sunsjam to submit your questions for the show. Uh, I got let, 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 let's how much time we got? Carry the one divided by three. All right, let's uh, go from this one from at the vengeance 6 What are reasonable expectations of Mikel Bridges for this upcoming season? We're not talking all defensive player. We're reasonable expectations. Yeah. I think reasonable really 15 and eight, something like that. 15 points, eight rebounds and getting that three point percentage up to like 38%. I know it seems like a lot. I think he was shooting like 35, 36 last year, but getting a couple percentages is closer to 40%, which is like what the NBA averages. If you're a good three point shooter, that's what I expect. And, uh, nothing really less. I think I feel like the roster's too full. It's such a great roster. We have, if they stay healthy, to where 15 and 8 is really the minimum I can expect from him. That's that's a lot, man. I mean, he's eight and eight point seven and three point six in his yeah. career, nine point one last year, four rebounds per game. Is so, he really a rebounder though? Like is no, he he's that, not. He's he not might not be, right? 
He's yeah, not. he's more of your defensive guy. You know, he's playing. He's your three and D guy. He's not down there getting the rebound. So fifteen and eight. He he throws down fifteen and eight, man, dude. The, the Suns are the number two seed. Yeah, because that's your fourth best player right there. Uh, for me, reasonable expectations are just a consistent starter. You know, in his career, he's only started what eighty eight of one hundred fifty five games. So half the games he's played in, I think that's kind of the design that Monty's going to go into it this year, but. You have to earn those minutes on a team that that's going to be that is going to be this deep, and barring injuries or COVID, is going to continue to be deep. You're going to have to earn every minute that you get out there, and that's a great thing for the team. It's going to make it inter competitive. It's like capitalism at work in a team. Like you earn your your time out there. So reasonable expectations for Mikel Bridges being a starter, starting as many games as, as he plays in, and I think that's going to be something that I'm really looking forward to this year. Uh, last one from at Sundress Dunks mailbag question. Do you, do any players on the Suns have a realistic shot to win six man of the year or most improved player and which player has the best chance? Oh yeah, by far. I'm calling it right now. I think Dario Sarge wins it this year for the Suns. I think he really, wins really that think award. so. Yeah. I swear to God. The I six man, right? Swear to God. Sorry. Jeez. Six man of the year. Six yeah. Man I of think the year. six man of the year. I actually think DeAndre Ayton has a really good chance of most improved player. I was looking at oddsshark.com the other day at kind of the different odds because I know that uh, on Bright Side of the Sun, Khalil is putting together an article that is uh, asking all the other fellow writers some questions pertaining to the awards this season. And as I was doing that, I saw DeAndre Ayton's like a plus 1,200 to win most improved player, which is number two on the list. So I was actually kind of wow. surprised there. And I was like, you, you know what? I don't know how you improve too much uh, from like 19 and 12 or whatever he put up last year. But, you know, if he, if he breaks into that 24, 25 points a game and still is getting those 12 rebounds, like I could definitely, and the Suns win, of course, I can definitely see that occurring, him getting that most improved player award. So, yeah, no, good pick. Seriously, I think, uh, I mean, if, if my prediction of Mikhail Bridges getting a 15 and eight, then that's most improved player. <laughs> you are always hey, you know, the Yeah, over uh, on the perimeter. Good job, Matthew. <laughs> Oh, geez. Um, <laughs> my God. Uh, you got anything else for everybody before we get out of here, Matthew? I do I, re I really don't. But have fun watching the game this Saturday. I'm a, I'll be at Zoo Lights with my six kids. We'll be hanging out. I'll be watching yeah. the game. Maybe some of them will get stolen. Who knows? But Yeah, don't don't lose any kids this weekend. That's the most important thing, okay? okay. If you can't right. watch the Suns game, don't lose your kids. Um, <laughs> just a reminder every, to all of our listeners who are in the Suns Jam Session Listener League, this podcast – Sunday night is when we're actually going to draw uh, the draft order. It'll come out of a hat. And even if you are not in the league, it's always good to hear other people's fantasy basketball team names. So we'll be drawing those, and then the draft will be on the 21st. So that'll be fun. Thank you for everybody who is joining us uh, and playing in the league. Uh, reminders for everybody to follow the, the, the show on Twitter, at Suns Jam. You can follow me on Twitter, at Darth Voida. You can follow Matthew on Twitter. At Matthew P. Lissy. Make sure there's no P in there. Don't throw people oh, off. My bad. My bad. You'll never find me now. No. Yeah, Matthew. you shouldn't do Matthew P. Lissy because people read it as Matthew Plissy. Matthew Plissy. Ooh, I like well, that. That's, that's your new so much better than just Lissy. Hey, Plissy. <laughs> Um, but make sure that you subscribe to the Bright Side of the Sun Podcast Network wherever you're listening to this podcast. If you are watching on YouTube, please subscribe. Please hit the bell because, like I said, we will be going live after games probably multiple times this year. Looking forward to that. Uh, thank you to all the listeners for hanging out for, with us. And if you're watching on YouTube, you get to see our brand new outro. Take care, everybody. Go home and love your family. <laughs>